basically games suck nowadays. This week on Backward Compatible, what are the pros and cons of designing tabletop role-playing games to be more accessible to new players? Plus, in honor of the 25th anniversary of the Sega Genesis, Jim devises a challenge to see who best remembers that classic console. BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. <laughs> Hello, Backward Compatible listeners. Um, I'm here at the Fillmore Pub in uh, North Dallas with... Uh, I'm Chris. <laughs> you pointed at me. With, I'm Chris. <laughs> yes. I'm Chris. Yes. I'm well, Richard. Hi. And Jim forgot to introduce himself, but this is Jim. I'm Jim. I was going to introduce myself last, <laughs> okay. trying to be, trying to be uh, the, the <laughs> consummate host here. Fair enough. I'm the guy who skipped out on the last podcast. So. Yeah, well, you had fam- familiar obligations, and uh, it, got, it gave us a chance to get Ben in here, so it's all I good. just hate that Ben guy. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'll yeah. help. Uh, we keep you guys out of the same room as much as possible. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm Jim. This is Chris. Uh, we also have Richard. You can't use gestures. Over I can't use gestures. Gestures. Okay. I'm pointing straight ahead. That that helps them, right? Well, yeah, the, 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 the ninjas who are listening will be able to like hear the wind displacement from your hands moving and be able to tell where we're at at the table and which way your hand was going. Right. I didn't it's know. Pretty what appropriate ninja. since we're playing through Strider right now. Oh, no, there yeah. you go. So <laughs> he's not a ninja. He's a Strider. <laughs> There's a difference. I mean, come on. Is there really a difference? He has kunai. Yeah, it's, uh, I don't know. Ninjas don't have really cool head scarves that kind of like flash flat behind them in the. Well, I, I think the idea is that there's no such thing as ninjas, and so like it's a future game, so we had to call them something different. No such form. thing as ninjas. <laughs> I'm, it's a joke. Oh. Chris, don't oh. walk home alone. Home home <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's a good thing it's daytime right now. Although that's not going to stop them, I guess. <laughs> so, anyway, I believe uh, Jamie got a game for us today. Yeah, actually, I have a game for us, a new game. Um, this is the 25th anniversary of the Sega Dreamcast, as of I believe. What is that? Thursday. The 25th anniversary of the Sega Dreamcast. And you mean Dreamcast or Genesis? Who's a what? The Sega Genesis. Genesis. Did I say Dreamcast? You said Dreamcast. Of course it's not the 25th anniversary. Uh, We're coming to you from the future. (laughs) (laughs) No, of the Sega Genesis. Yes, uh, also known as Sega Mega The jig is up. (laughs) Um, And uh, I believe it was as of Thursday. So in honor of that, we have... um, a short game that I have for us, and I'm going to read off parts of the story synopsis from the game manuals of different games. Now, these are directly from the manuals. Directly back from the manuals. Back when these manual things actually came in game cases. Yes, back, they still do, technically. Back in the days when the manual was, was less technical information and more cool, badass backstory. Yeah. Uh, sometimes it had and very little to do with the actual game itself. Man, when I would, like, get a new game but I couldn't play it when I got it, I'd take the oh, manual. I did the exact yeah, same me. thing, dude. Or if I was really into yeah. the game, I'd buy the strategy guide. And you'd bring the and guide would, to school? I'd yeah. read the guide cover to cover yep. and then, like, eventually play the game, like, two weeks later. Basically, games suck nowadays. Yeah, <laughs> or like during uh, during Christmas, where you would you'd you'd get a free game, you'd, like, what, free? you'd get a gift game, yeah. and you'd open it up and you'd want to play it right away. But your family is like having you know Christmas meeting time and Whatever. dinner and a whole bunch of BS, and it would be considered rude if you used up the television to play a game. So you pull out they the manual. Don't get it. Pull out Parents the manual. don't get yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, with Parents the uh, so cool man. Ever, ever since the Wii, though, I've actually been able to like get people to gather around the Wii for playing stuff so I mean it's all good but anyway all right so tell us more about this game that Chris and I are gonna fail horribly okay so here's here's how the game works so I'm gonna be the host and I'm oh, going so it's to, just us it's embarrassing just you ourselves. Too. Yes. yes it's, it's just, just us. you too and well someone has to be the host Fair so enough. I'm going to read off um, descriptions of story story synopsis from different games they may or may not be from the Sega Genesis um, I'm gonna ask each of you in turn if you can tell first you're gonna tell me is it from the Sega Genesis or not okay then regardless of your answer if you, if you are correct you get one point regardless of your answer I will ask the other person involved what the name of the game is if they get it right they get a point okay if they get it wrong I'll go back to whoever I asked the original question to and they have a chance to steal that point do we have to answer things uh, in the form of a question? No. Mr. Trebek? <laughs> no, it's not. It's not what just. is Sanic the Hedgehog? <laughs> <laughs> Sanic, uh, Sanic the Hedgehog will not be one of the choices I can go ahead and let you know uh, right now. So don't, don't make that guess. You just took obvious. away my advantage. <laughs> I will say these games, these, I did not choose super obscure games. These are relatively um, well known. even more embarrassing. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> yeah. These are relatively well known. That being said, 
if you have a general understanding of the game and you hear the story synopsis, it might not make any sense to you. That's part of the fun. Cool. All Some of these right. have multiple uh, multiple choices here. Let's oh, see. wonderful. Let's yeah, see. multiple like like excerpts. All right, let's do this then. Okay. We're, we're, I'm going to start uh, right off the bat with one that is particularly weird. Again, may or may not be from Sega uh, Genesis. It could be from another system. These are all from somewhere. Okay. 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 Tricky best. So, so no fake, <laughs> fake descriptions you wrote. What I will say <laughs> is that I didn't, and it's, listen to me carefully, I didn't make any of these up. Okay. So, they exist. <clears throat> That's all I'll say. Take that as you will. Okay. Okay. Um, I will start with uh, Chris. All right. Because you have both the uh, alphabetically, the, the, the closest first name and closest last name. Oh, That's there you racist. go. Yeah, <laughs> it is. It's, it's namist. Literist. Alphabetist. <laughs> okay, here we go. We always have to find an order for something. All Direct right. quote. Goodbye, world peace. Mr. Big, the psycho mastermind of crime, is wiping out love on our planet. He and his goons are kidnapping every child on Earth. Mr. Big plans to brainwash all these innocent children and turn them into slaves. Back when games were so innocent. <laughs> games were innocent, yes. Is Mr. Big the actual name of the villain, or did you make, is that like a replacement? If I replace, in some of these, I replace the name of villains and heroes with this game's hero or this game's villain. Okay. I chose not to with Mr. Big because it's the first question and because I think that y'all won't know anyway. <laughs> okay. So. Thanks, Jim. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to go ahead and say yes, it's a Genesis game. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay. It is a 50-50 chance. Very hard. Yes. Um, <laughs> you, are flip? you are correct. It uh, is yes. a Genesis game. It. You get one point. All right. Now it goes over to Richard. Now, Richard... <laughs> If you have, you have a choice here, you can either guess the name of the game, and I'm going to make it on the fly change because I can't as the host. You can guess the name of the game. If you're correct, I'll give you two points. Mm. However, if you want, I can read the second clue, the second excerpt from the game, and then you can still guess the name of the game, and you only get one point. Ah, oh, interesting. I'll take the second excerpt because okay. it's, why not? Okay, second excerpt. All right. Mr. Big is the ultimate bad guy, and no one knows how to stop him. Oh, excuse me. How to stop him? Exclamation point. Until this game's hero, the champion of love and peace, takes charge. <laughs> yes. Only this game's hero can rescue the children and demolish Mr. Big and his hoods. To do it, this is your big key, your big clue. Our uh, this game's hero summons his star magic, the superpower sent to him on a shooting star. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, no, no, no. Well, you have a guess, though. You, you get a free guess, but it's not going to be negative points if you get it wrong. Worms. Worms? <laughs> <laughs> Surprisingly, that's the wrong answer. Uh. Okay, back to you, Chris. You can get an additional point for guessing correctly. Uh. Think about his, think shooting about his star, star power. Remember, he is the champion of love and peace. Love and peace. Who is the champion of love and peace? I'm go okay. This is Day probably man. wrong. I'm Day just gonna man. throw out a guess. Mm -hmm. Barney. No. Okay. I'm sorry. That's incorrect. <laughs> uh, so you might be surprised or not to know. The champion of love, love and peace is none other than Michael Jackson. Pop. Oh! This is Michael Jackson's <laughs> Moonwalker. No! One of the earlier games for the Sega Genesis. Oh, that's amazing. No, no, <laughs> please, why? <laughs> Michael Jackson, uh, of course, has star magic. Of course um, he does. That he gets, that was sent to him from a shooting star. Mm -hmm. And he defeats evil with his children. Yes. So, so far... <laughs> saving the children from... Saving yeah. the children, because he's the champion of love and peace. Yep. There we go. All right, moving so, on. Uh, Chris is in the lead with one point, but now it's to Richard for the first Are you clip. really in the lead? <laughs> Am I really? <laughs> okay. Uh, next one here. Champion of love and peace. Although you were once a brave and awesome Roman centurion, the rigors of this journey demand a supernatural display of strength. And so, you are bestowed with the powers of this game. Obviously, I'm replacing the game's title with this game. Yes, it's a Genesis game. You say yes? Yeah. It is. One point. I think I might know this one. Now, it goes to Chris first. Chris, do you know the name of this game? Now, if mm. not, Richard can still you can get an additional point. Um, there is... I, now, you do get an extra clue if you want to just take Go the one point. Go ahead and give me the okay. extra clue, yeah. The, here's the power that I mentioned before. The mm. power to transform your being into part animal, part human of formidable force. 
I'm pretty That's sure. A pretty big clip. I'm pretty sure I've seen this game, but the name doesn't come to me. Um, former Roman centurion turned into an animal. But you also gave gave Richard the extra clue by doing. Yeah. That. Uh, I'm gonna guess Minotaur. No. Okay. Richard. Well, now I don't know it anymore. Really? Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, I, this is a pretty when, obvious one. When I read the when you read the first one, I thought it would be I might be getting this name wrong. Ghouls and ghosts or ghouls and goblins. But when you said trans Yeah, when you transform yourself into something, I don't know about that one. Altered Beast. Alt oh, oh. The most well known. Duh. Yes. Uh, very, right. very common. I mean, it's Greek it's anyway. Easy so, for you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Anyway, what what's the what character do you play as in Ghouls and Goblins or whatever? The name? Oh, jeez. I can't think of the guy. No, but I mean, aren't you like a Roman soldier or something? Or am I crazy? No. I don't believe so, no. Okay. I think you're like you're like a medieval knight. Oh, it's just knight. a medieval knight. Medieval knight. I forgot okay. the guy's name. I'm, I'm, I'm blanking. Someone who's going to be very pissed listening to this. Ghouls and Goblins, I think that was King Arthur, actually. But like, you're right. Oh, yeah. I think yeah. you're right. Yes, it is. He's it's a Marvel yeah. character. You're right. Yeah. It is. Or Marvel vs. Capcom character. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cap it's a Capcom character, not Marvel. Yeah, I know. But I mean, he's he in, in NBC. Boxers, which right. is, uh, yeah, no, I, I should know because I play NBC. Yeah, I know. So. You're totally right. He is in NBC. Yeah. Cool. All right. Um, okay, cool. So next one, we're going to go back to Chris here. Next one. Yeah. Um, like, I was cruising on my bike with the map to hip city sitting pretty in my saddlebag. Then, talk about a drag, me and Eugene raced out from a speed trap to snap up my map. That rat took flight in his rickety crate and scattered my map all over the United States. Uh, I, 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 I hope I read that correctly. I, I applaud you for attempting to rap. <laughs> um, I did my best, and that's, that actually is part of your clue, by the way, <laughs> yeah, the way yeah. that I read it. I, I think I know what it is. I'm going to guess not Genesis. You're going to say not Genesis. Right. You were wrong. Ah. It is a Genesis game. Okay. Uh, Richard, do you want to know that? you want to guess the name of this game? I'm going to need the other clue. Uh, no. You need the other clue? Okay. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> this is not much of a clue. I'll be fair. Oh, great. Now mean Eugene's hunting me down as I search town to town until every shred of map is found. And when I snag all ten, I'm back on track to Hip City again. Wait. Now remember, Dennis is out in the mid-90s. Wait. Early to mid-90s. Is this the Cheetos game? I'm going to give it to you. I'm What's gonna it? give it to you. You're correct. It is. It is Chester Cheetah Wild Wild Quest. Oh my! God. And I Wild will get. I will Wild give West. it to you. As the co-host, I have that that ability. Out of curiosity, was that multi-platform? Um, I don't think so. Not this one. Okay. Uh, there were there were actually two two Chester Cheetah games. Okay. I can't believe I got that one. One of them, one of them was multi-plat, and I believe this one was the Genesis. Okay. Was this, but I'm not 100. Because sure. I'm pretty sure I remember there being a Chester Cheetah game from Super well, Nintendo. There was, but I think that was, I forgot the name of that one, like Cool It's cool a different something. one. Okay. Yeah, and it was, I think that one was not, that one was on both. Okay. Genesis. I think this one might have been Genesis and um, Game Gear. Gotcha. Okay, cool, cool. Okay. All right, next so, one. So, uh, right now we've got Richard in the lead with two points. Damn right. <laughs> uh, Chris with one point. <laughs> and now it is, I believe, Richard's turn. It is Richard's turn. Awesome. Okay. Time for dominance. I'm the greatest. <laughs> you are. So far, you're doing pretty well. I'm the best. Game number three. No, remember, whenever I say things like this game's hero, that's of course not the game. That's me replacing sure. it. This game's hero is no ordinary father, and neither are you. With the perfect wig, a little makeup, and a dress for all occasions, you are this game's hero. Free to be the woman you never knew you could be, this game's hero needs your help to create a whole new family with his entire... Wait, whole new life with his entire family. I think I might know what this is. I'm just going to say no, it's not a Genesis game. You're right. One point. Okay. Now, Chris. I'm just where is this? Th where is this from? This is Doubtfire. You got it. Yes. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> oh no. So, Richard, you're still in the lead with three points. I should retire because I just got two points. You're right. You did. No, but I got Good another point. point, so I'm at four. No, you're at three. You got one. You had two. Oh, really? Four. You had two. two. You're at three. Now you're at three. He's oh. right. He's right. He didn't ask for the second clue. He's right. Oh, so, um, you're totally bitch. right. Thank you for reminding me. Awesome. So, you're tied at four. Or tied. Tied three. three. Yes, tied at three. Cool. Sorry. All right. <laughs> we're, we're definitely not master students. All right, so no. shall we call this the uh, final round? Final round. All right. Final round. Um, this is for all the marbles. All the marbles. Let me pick the... I've got two different choices All the here. marbles. Okay. Isn't that a luxury resource in Civ? Well, that's just marble, I guess. Man. Oh, jeez. Both of these are relatively hard, but that's fine. Okay. We're going to go ahead and do this, and I believe it's to Chris. Okay. 
So this is gonna, this is awesome gonna determine. Yes, okay. it's gonna. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna determine quite a bit. Okay. okay. This game's villain. Notice how I wasn't able to say his name. Right. Which means that would might tell you a clue. Okay. This game's villain, the leader of a band of swashbuckling space pirates, is terrorizing the galaxy. You must pilot the only remaining Milky Way attack craft into combat to stop this game's villain and his buccaneers. Milky Way attack craft. Buccaneers. Milky Way being the galaxy, not, right. not a type of spacecraft. Right, not right. Confusing. Sure, sure. We have to be specific on this. Yes, very specific. Is it a Genesis game or not? Uh, this point might be crucial to victory. No, remember, uh, these could I'm, be games from other systems, too. I'm torn, yeah. Um, I'm gonna say... not Genesis. I'm sorry, you get no point. Ah. Uh, it is a Genesis game. Okay. Now, Richard, I can give you an additional hint related to the game. Yeah, I'm gonna need it. Okay. Wouldn't matter anyway, either way, you just get... You, you win with That's a That's true, I just need the one point. Right. You... This is not specific, this is... Okay. You are a Zig type starfighter in this shoot 'em up. Also known as Shmup. Apart from the manual, it's the Zig type starfighter. There is an additional clue. I know this, as part I know of, this, I know this. Now, know Chris this. believes he knows exactly what it is. <laughs> I still don't know. You still don't know. But take a guess, though, it's a free guess. Zigzag. <laughs> no. <laughs> I thought about it for a second, but no. Zero wing. You got it. Yes. Chris got it. Chris Victory. wins. Victory. It was zero wing. Take off every zig. Um, zero wing was, is the famous, poorly translated. You have no chance. Take your time. Yeah. All your base are belong to us. Really? All your base are belong Never to us. Never actually played that game. Yeah. It's it's actually not bad. It gets it gets a bad rap because the translation from Japanese to English is hilariously bad. Uh, Gameplay wise, it's it's a decent game. Like, it's got wasn't really that the sound. one where like you could like suck in meteors and shoot them out at people? I think so. Yeah. So it's a pretty interesting game. It's suitable. Okay, so Chris wins with uh, I believe five points or four points. Four, four points. points. Yay. Four to three. Yay! Four to three. Close game. I barely edged out Richard. Woo! All right. So uh, speaking of anniversaries, I believe so our um, the cheetah game. <laughs> yeah. I believe our um, our main uh, topic for today was going to be uh, tabletop role playing games. Um, mm -hmm. I wrote about this in one of my feature articles. I also have one or two quick thoughts about it. Um, Chris is kind of the tabletop role playing guy of our group. In a way, yeah. Although what's funny is that I probably have like the least amount of experience years wise compared to you guys. Yeah, but I mean that's kind of like, aren't you doing that as part of your like your master's thesis? Is like it, a role playing. It, it, play, it plays into it. Yeah. yeah, it's not exactly, but eh, same, same big deal. And so, we're, all, we're all currently involved playing a uh, tabletop role playing game. As where well. I'm yeah. the most awesome character, obviously. <laughs> obviously, yeah. We <laughs> just finished Jim uh, the Ninja. We just finished uh, <laughs> the Jewel of Yavin, which is a um, adventure book for um, Edge of the Empire, Star Wars. Um, really cool system. I think we all really like it. Um, what I really like about it myself is that it's, while it does have a lot of different combat mechanics and different skills and stuff to play into combat, um, they have different classes that are actually dedicated to non-combat sort of roles. Right. And so you can actually get through the game without having any muscle. And especially in this um, adventure book, like they don't throw ambushes at you every two seconds. So like our group was like I was a politician. Jim was a doctor who doesn't like to kill people. Richard well, he can. Yeah, he can. He just chooses not to. I, I, yeah. Well, it's more like I can in incapacitate them with pressure points. Yeah. He's a ninja. Yeah, yeah. he's a ninja with shot clubs. And then uh, Richard is uh, our hacker who is completely incompetent in combat, as we learned from uh, fighting the security. Yeah. Droids. Would you like to tell that that story? Because that's a pretty great story. Not particularly. <laughs> so. Well, there might have been this droid that was like hundreds of years old and covered in dust and my character got into an epic shootout with it in a long hallway where I think about 10 blaster shots were fired and everything but the droid was hit. Yeah. And I almost died. <laughs> and it was between, both of y'all were missing though because yeah. the droid yeah. was terrible too, <laughs> but you were also equally bad yeah. and neither of you could hit each other. It was great. It was like two stormtroopers in, in a firefight. Yeah. And then, our, uh, and then our other uh, party member was a uh, pilot who's also not exactly combat savvy. So, I mean, pretty much all of us, it, it was kind of an Ocean's Eleven sort of thing where we were... Did we actually take out a single person in this I don't think we did, not actually. Hell, no. I, I think there was there were some people that were that were taken out by nefarious means. Like I know I, like, the... stun-gunned or yeah. stun, stun grenaded some guards. We, and there we was some sabotage a... before that big race. Yeah, and we took a guard out with the... Um, or you took a guard out with the, the little, like... 
poison shot that I made. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Incapacitating shot, rather. Like, syringe. But I don't think we ever actually... Oh, during the during the, um, the race, some of the fighters were blown up. Yeah. Anyway, so this is sort of a system that shies away from combat. And that kind of got me thinking about how in Dungeons & Dragons, you know, that's kind of the go-to system for the kill the dragon, collect a loot kind yeah. of gameplay. It's kind of and, the quintessential role-playing game in yeah. a way. And a lot of people really, really didn't like the 4th edition adaptation of D&D. They definitely intended to make it more streamlined and accessible, translatable to a bunch of different games. That was I, the one that was translated to uh, their board game systems, right? Yeah, they it, it was a board game, and then they also used it as the system for a Facebook game, if that tells you anything about its simplicity. Really? Yeah. So the Heroes of Neverwinter Facebook game was pretty much a like energy based dungeon crawl you know your certain attacks hit this many tiles a very simplistic game now can dragons um, destroy your crops in this game unfortunately or? not you cannot <laughs> harvest crops and sell them to strange people on the side of the road but you know you take what you can get but so this comes in a long line of D&D game adaptations, which a lot of people might not know. You know, with Baldur's Gate, they use D&D 2. Yeah. With Neverwinter Nights, they use D&D 3.5. You know, so a lot of these games have the D20 rule set as their, like, driving game mechanic. And so 4 was kind of... Um, both intended to make the role-playing game more accessible to a bunch of new people, mm -hmm. but also to make it easily adaptable into the modern and mainstream action sort of genre. Yeah. I, I think there's actually a lot of MMO influence in 4E as well. Yeah, um, I think so. you well, this didn't, they also tried to make the Neverwinter MMO, which unfortunately yeah. <laughs> didn't work out. They had, a, they had Dungeons and Dragons online. I don't know if no, no well, that was an older system. It. It, was, it was based on the older system, yes. But um, so, did they? I was going to ask actually, if you know, did they actually make any video games that use the four system RPG role playing games that use the the D and D four system? Because I don't think they did. Um, I, I think if they did, it might have been like D and D online. Um, I'm not sure though when that came out. No, D and D online was before four came out. Oh, was it? Okay. I played it. it was You're talking about video games? Yes. Then I don't think so. I don't no. think so either. I'm not aware of it. No. They made yeah. several that, that use the two. The, like uh, I said, there's edition, the, there, and I, some that use 3.5. Yeah. But. Like I like I said, there's the Facebook game, but okay. I don't know if there was ever a video game. I know there was a D and D game called uh, like. Daggerdale or Daggerfall. Yes. But I don't know if that was the 4.0 rule system or if it was just a totally independent game. Mm, I, I, my guess would be that it wasn't 4E, but I'm not sure. I actually have played it, and to be honest with you, having played both 4E and Daggerfall, if it was based specifically and tried trying to emulate 4E, didn't do a good job of proving it, because yeah. I never really felt like it was I'm so. pretty sure, I played it a little bit, and I'm pretty sure it's an entirely independent That's the system. impression I got, too. But so, you know, we're talking about this today because the D&D... Fifth edition recently launched, and uh, Chris and I actually, and I think Jim might be joining us after this podcast. We're gonna head over to the local comic book shop, Madness Games, and we're gonna, at least I'm gonna roll up a character. They like you to uh, roll up the dice in front of them, and they'll put your character into their online system. And then if you travel to any cons or you play in any D and D, you know, encounters events at any comic shop, they can pull up your character sheet. And so it's just kind of. Uh, Kind of like the new Friday Night Magic for D and D players, which I think I think is really cool because it's you know kind of establishing you know a you know D and D is probably the most pervasive RPG out there. Yeah, and so this makes it so you can play with literally anyone who plays D and D. Right, and so really I cool. think one of the cool things about this, and you know, even though I personally wasn't a fan of Fourth Ed, I like the whole accessibility angle that they're taking with this. You know, and I'm the kind of RPG player that I don't know if you guys have played such systems like Pathfinder is a more common one. I know a lot of people have played I've Pathfinder. Heard of Pathfinder. Pathfinder was based on 3.5, wasn't it? Yeah. Right, it's colloquially known as like 3.75, you know, like that's what people call it. Um, and then there's like Hackmaster, which is just like the taking the D&D 3.5 complexity to a ludicrous level. The thing with uh, that I find interesting about Pathfinder is I know that they made some Pathfinder, uh, at least one Pathfinder board game. And, Did they? Yes. And I was actually, because I've seen it in, in stores, but I've never played it. I was oh. curious if y'all played it and if it tries to adapt the 3.5 rule set. Well, I call it 3.5. The Pathfinder rule set to a board game space, which almost seems like if they were able to do it, it kind of spits in the face of D&D trying, basically feeling like they had to make the four the 4E system more simplistic in order to translate it to board games. I, I feel like if they did do that, and I don't know if they did or not, 
but my thought would be that if they did that, they're basically trying to have a more sort of like action oriented sort of like here's an encounter that's happening in a space that we've pre-planned. It's basically like a pre-made encounter in a sense. Mm -hmm. um, whereas with the D&D board games, I think the idea is that like you can actually take your D&D 4E character and have that character be in these board games. And they, they were meant to be, you know, board games, meaning relatively accessible, um, you know, modern board games tend to be like, you know, quicker and easier to pick up, easier to play. Um, they, they try to sort of embrace the fact that, you know, computer games can be very simulationist board games have to be a little bit more sort of socially oriented, easier to get into. Not that all board games are super simple, but I think they try to. God, well, there's, super there's, yeah. there's also there's clear rules that of things that you can and cannot do in a board game. Mm -hmm. Whereas in an RPG, the player can basically describe what they want to do to the GM, and yeah. it's completely you know they either do it. Right. It's the difference the between you know using rules to play the game and using rules as an aid to playing. The yeah, game. exactly. Right. Yeah. yeah. So. And that's a big part of playing any sort of tabletop role-playing game is the fact that you can bend the rules a bit. You know, I can say, I want to try this crazy thing that's not even mentioned anywhere in the book. And the GM, because he's a human being, can sort of say, okay, well, what we'll do is we'll have you roll this dice in this way and you have to beat this number or something like that, however they want to translate it. And then if you succeed, you succeed. And, you know, you just had this thing that wasn't supposed to be possible in the game. It just happened. Right. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely... For anybody who's played RPGs for a number of years, you've probably had that really satisfying moment where you just rolled like three 20s in a row and some <laughs> insanely miraculous thing happened, you know? Or you just roll terribly like some yeah, people the I opposite. Well, Multiple speaking ones. of miracles, and uh, I remember one of our Burning Wheel campaigns, you were playing a uh, super powerful wizard. Mm -hmm. Burning Wheel, for those who don't know, is a <laughs> sort of a role-playing um, oriented system where they stay further away from the mechanics, and uh, it's the the default setting is very very Tolkien esque. Yeah. So of course uh, we played it with the professor, and he decided to run a Lord of the Rings campaign, in which there. was awesome. So I essentially played one of the unknown wizards in the Lord of the Rings universe, one of the blue wizards. Blue wizard. Yep. And because we stuck to the game mechanics. I quickly became ridiculously overpowered to the point where we really couldn't play the game anymore because it was just too yeah, unfair. We, we, if, we, if we were going to continue, we were going to all re-roll new characters, but I think he rolled like the equivalent to like 2,000 dice or something like that. Yep. Yeah, and did. It, it was did. like It was literally like a miracle level spell that he was casting. Mm -hmm. It was pretty insane. Mm -hmm. But anyway, moving on. <laughs> <laughs> but so this, this concept of accessibility, you know, when people talk about role-playing games, I feel like it's either or stuff like that where it's insider talk about like oh this one time I rolled 2,000 dice or you know oh this one time I rolled a percentile dice and I checked this table on this side and the game said that I did this awesome explodey head thingy yeah. you know or it's you know I was hanging out with my friends on a Thursday night and we were we ran this campaign we told a collaborative story you yeah, know yeah. and so I think that D&D &D for a long time has had this kind of really straight and narrow rule set that has encouraged game playing rather than storytelling it's D&D &D and systems like that that you get the phenomenon of the rules lawyer the player who's not necessarily the GM, maybe sometimes it is the GM, is um, like very picky about like you know making sure the rules are followed to the letter. Right. You know, making sure like uh, you know even if the GM says this is what happens, he says, well, actually, if you look in chapter two here in subsection such and such. Exactly. And you know, D and D is notoriously one of those systems that encourages that because, I mean, they have rules for the uninitiated. You know, that are like. What kind of terrain are you standing on? Yeah. Oh, well, then you move such and such speed based on what you're standing on. And they encourage uh, phys rep, physical representation, where yeah. you bring like miniatures and you lay them on a grid. Yeah, you've got a one inch grid. I, mean, I think 4E was actually very reliant on the phys rep aspect. Absolutely, of it. they were. Yeah, I, although be, you, because I, they actually turned their spells into, <laughs> instead of like, this affects a 30 meter oh, radius. Oh, yeah, they would like, say spaces. Yeah, it, this yeah. affects a nine square yeah. space. It's See, like, that really? kind of surprised me because I'd, I'd been using used to playing um, 3.5 and then also playing before that I'd played some uh, second edition way back in the day and I never really played Fizz Rep before yeah. and because you can of course do it with any either of those systems but it doesn't feel essential and with 4 yeah. it feels F essential yeah Fizz Repping can be fun but you know that's one of those things it's time where to to well, I, I think they might have said though in 4E that like you know each square is a meter so if you wanted to you could translate it yeah, but yeah, like, it just doesn't work that easily. Yeah, and, trying you know, to do the math in your head is kind yeah. of yeah. And and so with 4E, 
they did this thing where they tried to make it really accessible. Wizards really wanted more people in the D&D IP. They the wanted a, a younger audience, too. Yeah, and, and yet by doing that, they ended up creating a system that was super rules-heavy. Right. You know, so they was like, well, maybe if we simplify it and turn it into more of like a modern thing that you might see in a game, more younger people will play D&D and will get new, fresh faces at D&D events and whatnot. Yeah. But then, because of that, they turned it into more of a game and less of, you know, the traditional yeah. role-playing experience. And they pushed some of their their traditional fans over to Pathfinder, which tried to sort of expand from 3.5, which mm -hmm. was so popular among D&D enthusiasts. And, you know, I don't know how many of our listeners, if you know, of all five of you, play role-playing games, but, you know, one of the common misconceptions is that you're either playing Warhammer, where you're rolling a bunch of dice and just killing the other person's units, right. or you're dressed up like an elf and speaking in a fake accent and things like that. <laughs> and really, it Both couldn't of which be... are fun. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> but really, it couldn't be further than the truth. I've been playing role-playing games since I was in middle school, and I have never, and I mean never, in a group of role-players, encountered somebody who actually role-plays like that oh, in sure. a yeah, casual no. setting. Pretty much like everyone I've played with, too, and I've been doing it, I think, again, for less time than you guys have. But, like, you know, pretty much... If I do have anyone who actually like, role plays, like tries to stay in character, it's not super serious. But most people actually want to say, "My character does this." Exactly, and so it's yeah. like, you know, there's a real emphasis not on the role playing aspect, which is, you know, it's important, but not really that important. But it's the collaborative storytelling that's really, really important. Right, and that's that's those are the moments you come away with. Mm -hmm. I, I think. I mean, there are times when you can have stories from D and D where it's like, oh man, like we we're down to like two HP and we we're trying to kill this dragon. I needed to roll a nineteen. I rolled a twenty and I crit and like you know and this big moment. But it's still based on the story, I think, right. because it came from the fact that you guys were down in a pinch and you pulled off something miraculous. There's, I was gonna say, there's also this really fun moment moments where you feel the opportunity to go against what the you, you know the GM wants to do. Absolutely. It's, it's very fun. Absolutely. I've, I've, I've played games where you know he wants you to say, go to a certain area to get information from someone, and instead you decide, as, as particularly when I'm playing as, as an evil party, which I've done in multiple, multiple <laughs> games, where you're like, well, you know what? We want to just go rob random people. <laughs> and coming up with different creative ways to, to rob people, disguise ourselves as other people, um... It can be very frustrating for the GM because he has to come up with a new story on the fly. But one of the things that that's one of the things that makes um, role-playing games a collaborative story is the GM is expected to accommodate players if they right. want to if they want to yeah. go in that, that's why I, I, I never plan. That's exactly yeah, why I never plan. It's part yeah. of the fun, though. Yeah, honestly, I I think the last time I actually planned out a prescriptive narrative was like the eighth grade. Mm. You know, you generally want to have like a plot line in order, but your players can throw anything yeah, at you. Yeah. And I feel like that's one of these things that we kind of lose with accessibility. And, you know, that's kind of strange thing to say, that accessibility decreases the, you know, the experience. And the creativity. And the that's creativity. allowed by players and, and I, GM. I, I, think that, I think you do have a point, because accessibility, I mean, if you have people who've played the older games and switched to these more accessible games, they do have, like, you know, they, they understand how these games work. Right. But accessibility <laughs> can also mean new people who've never played these games before, and you can might have, like, a skewed sort of perception of how they're supposed to work. You might not right. understand that you can bend the rules and you can do stuff like that. Like, I, uh, I played a fourth ed game a while ago and you know when I, I built my character and I had to focus on all of these different stats and skill investments and pick all my different abilities that normally like so you know in the games that we play let's let's talk about this in Burning Wheel there are no like real specific skills and spells and whatnot there are generalist skills that are derived from a very small number of core stats yeah. for your and, characters. And by that you mean for those that haven't played it, you mean there's not like these special abilities. Right. Like in a video game there are just general skills. Like right. you've unlocked so, this skill, press right. XY to do it. Yeah, yeah. So, it's not so, one of those things. So the skills you might see in a, in a more fast and loose game like Burning Wheel or the Fate system would be like, you know, 
uh, mending or animal husbandry right. or something like that. And then you as a player come up with a creative way to employ that skill. You know, so you could use animal husbandry from everything to diagnosing that an animal is sick, yeah. to utilizing animals in creative ways, to constructing a sort of... I know a, a friend of ours was playing and he created in this medieval fantasy setting uh, a horse-powered, you know, source of renewable energy. Like, and, you know, and that's... Those are all very extreme examples, but it's all derived from this one really basic skill. Whereas in D&D, you have the skill use rope. Well, the other thing that's interesting, too, is in Burning Wheel, you can use what's called forks, fields of related knowledge, which will let you add a bonus die if you have another skill that kind of applies to the situation. So, you know, to use the animal husbandry thing, um, you know, animal husbandry means you're good with horses, and then you have a stealth skill, and so if you're trying to keep a horse quiet to get, like, you know, out of a town at night or something like that, then you can fork in your uh, stealth skill to say, I'm also really good at, you know, keeping things quiet, staying undetected, that sort of deal. Do you say something, Jeff? No, no. I, I, so, I forgot. My, my understanding of uh, D&D 5th uh, edition is that um, it's actually kind of going back to the roots of like old school like Redbox D&D, where it was actually fairly rules light. Um, it, it feels more sort of war gamey simulationist than we might be used to. Yeah. Um, but it was pretty much like you have a few stats, everything basically is derived from those stats, and most of the game really comes down to strategically thinking through, like, okay, I'm in this room, how do I explain to the GM how I'm getting out of this room? That's yeah, did, did y'all play, and it was, it came out somewhat recently, it was meant to be a reimagining of the um, D&D 1 first edition rules, and I, I want to say it was called Sword and Sorcery. It was meant to be the, and I'm actually looking it up right now, Okay. Um, it was meant to be the, um, a free re-release of of D and D one e rules. Really? Yeah, and it's actually a game I, I'm actually interested in playing just to kind of see um, how it works, how it functions. Um, yeah. See, a lot of these uh, the issues that I find with the reimaginings of different things is they try to translate them to a modern audience. Mm. It, this one doesn't. See, it doesn't at all. But see, like when. You know, in in the typical cases when they translate it to you know what is supposedly a modern audience, people kind of because games are so much more pervasive now, especially digital computer games, people feel like they have to up the gaminess of it. When in reality, doing that is so restrictive to what I would say the defining factor and something that you kind of touched on in your feature article is that. Role-playing games are, by nature, procedurally mediated. You sure. know? Yeah. Whereas, and in games, you know what? Well, and of course, I love the hell out of games, so this isn't like a fault on their part. Oh, for sure. Yeah. They are very restrictive, linear, or branching narratives. Yeah. You know, whereas, you know, if if you bring a host of mechanics and you have to follow these rule sets and whatnot. You suddenly severely limit your players. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that for sure. So. And that's why actually I like systems that have fewer rules than more. Like, you know, it's not a bad thing to have rules because it kind of helps to structure things if you're trying to be a little bit more detailed. But at the same time, I like the games that really try to be open and focus on the narrative. I like, if there are rules, I like the rules to be related to, like, how does my character behave and how does this story play out, essentially. So let me relate this a little more to the other side of the argument where, so for example, I was reading through the first, the fifth edition rule book last night in preparation for today. Cool, cool. And one of the new wizard abilities is this thing called over channel. And if you use it, you can choose one of your spells at a certain level and deal maximum damage with it when you use this ability. But you can only use this ability once in a full day's rest period and if you use it again you inflict like a ton of like necrotic damage on yourself. It's pretty intense. Okay. But so I... My first inclination was, why does this need to specifically be an ability, and why couldn't the player just tell the GM, hey, I want to try this thing, I want to tax my character's magical ability to this point where I want you to roll damage against me, but I also want you to let me do this really powerful thing. Right, yeah. Oh, the fire department's going it's, it's almost like a negotiation between the player and the GM. I think the reason that they had to make a rule for it is because most players will want to get away with as much as they can with no cost. Well, and but, so, but then there are players, if you come into it with the right mindset, where if you can basically negotiate with the GM, say like, hey, I want to go above and beyond here, but in exchange, I'll let you tax me if I fail this roll. But there's like also, that. you know, I, I sort of want to try taking the opposite side of the accessibility argument okay. for a second. Sure. And a lot of these new players that are first, you know, they're coming to the systems, they're brand new, um, 
how do they know to do these things? How do they think to have their characters do more than just a list of skills? Yeah. Because, you know, when you play a video game, your wizard knows fireball, lightning bolt, etc., etc., but they might not necessarily have an ability like over channel or in the same contextuality of over channel. Well, I think I think as long as you explain to the players up front that or you try to imbue the sense of role play like you're actually there. So you have so you encourage the players to think. Let's say you have a lightning spell. How might you use that lightning spell to benefit you? Well, sure you can shoot them directly with lightning, but let's say they're standing in a puddle. What if you shoot the puddle? Mm-hmm. That should conduct the electricity throughout to anyone that's staying in the puddle, and therefore you you're able to affect everyone with that lightning spell instead of just one person. Yeah. And so I, I it think, gives you an idea. And, and there's like sometimes when video creativity. games will give them ideas like that, like Bioshock had that with their lightning yeah. stuff. But I think you know the question that you're asking, Richard, is um, you know kind of like how do we teach them how to role play if they never role play right. before? Because and part of that I think is mentorship. I think you know sure. if you're playing with someone who knows it, but also, and I, I will say that some RPG systems I've seen actually are good about saying hey, this is a part of what role-playing is, is you're allowed to break the rules a little bit, or you're allowed to be creative. Um, although, that being said, I don't think a lot of them really do more than just mention that, and so they don't really, like, imbue the players, like, I don't know if that's the right word, but, like, really, like, give them the sense that, like, hey, this is how the game is played. But, so, that's an interesting accessibility comparison between video games and analog games, because with uh, with video games, people often refer to, like, the golden grail, or the holy grail of, uh, tutorial stages with like games like Mario and Mega Man. You start on the left side of the screen, your character's facing the right side, and the first few moments of gameplay teach you how to play. Right. Whereas with a, an RPG system, the way you play is defined in a 200-page book. Right. And so, for example, in Bioshock, shooting the water with electricity they tell you, hey, you can probably do that. And so you do that and you see the enemy get electrocuted and they die. But you don't see, like, damage numbers popping up above their head right. like in an MMO. And right, the, the, right. the game system isn't transparent. It's 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 walled off by, like, these stage curtains. Sure. Whereas in an RPG, say a player did want to shoot a puddle with lightning. Now, if an inexperienced GM or a rules-heavy table they wanted to pull up the rule book and look for that. Oh, it's not in the rule book. How do we do that? You know, that's something that either a GM would have to come up with on the fly, right. or if you're playing a super rules-heavy system like Hackmaster, they actually do have tables for everything like that. Right. right. I mean, See, Hackmaster has tables for yeah. how much damage you take when you pee on yourself. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I would think that one would come up to come up come down to rather a GM that understands that. Oh, the way that electricity might work if you had sh- if you were able to channel electricity into a puddle and should probably just for example apply whatever damage you might do to one player to everyone to in the everyone. puddle right so there you, are, don't, you don't have to make it super complicated there are make, pretty like, simple solutions yeah i agree but i mean what happens when you put a rule like that in your rule book as opposed to leaving oh, it out entirely yeah. i think you should never put it in the rule book in my opinion i think it should be the sort of thing where you impl- you encourage players to come up with creative ways to use their skills, yeah. and then let then empower the GMs to interpret th- that creative use and encourage it in their players. And the way you encourage it is to whenever they do something creative like that, have it be successful. And I, I think this is something that's not exactly what we're talking about here, but um, kind of a similar concept is in um, Apocalypse World, Dungeon World, kind of like that whole yeah. blank world thing. Yeah. What they actually tell you to do, and um, you know, the, it kind of counts on the GM having studied up and knowing how the system works, because a lot of it has to do with how well the GM runs the game. Mm. But they basically tell you, treat it like a story first and foremost. Don't even worry about the rules. Just say what you're doing. And then if you say something that would basically invoke a rule, then the GM will recognize and say, okay, it sounds like you're doing this. We're going to go ahead and roll based on this and figure out what happens. That's exactly what they do in Burning Wheel. Like, the last page in the Burning Wheel rulebook, as you guys know, it's a chapter called Don't Use This Rulebook. Yeah. Yeah. Like, (laughs) you know, and that's really counterintuitive, I would imagine, to the D&D crowd. And so that's what I'm wondering with this release of Fifth Fifth Ed, which, I mean, we'll find out some of that here in about an hour or two. Sure, sure. You know, and it's like, what, what are you sacrificing for this accessibility? What are you changing about the system in 
to to bring in more players, and and what will that will that have an adverse effects on your veteran players? Right. And you know, at the same time, you can also say that veteran players will probably just flip through the rule book and then play it without it, so it yeah. doesn't even matter. Right. Right. But you know, there there are arguments to be made for what at what cost does accessibility come? Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, we were talking about this a couple of podcasts ago with like episodic video games and Telltale games. They really fight for this accessibility, but at the same time, by doing that, they eschew a lot of typical game design elements like skill gating yeah. and things like that. And what does that do to the the fun factor in a in a narrative? Right. Um, I think you can also relate that to the the D and D world because you're essentially gathered around a table telling a story, which I mean, it's pretty fun, I think. But mm -hmm. a lot of people might not be all too enthralled by sitting around a table telling a story with people for six hours at a time, and they kind of need those moments of either combat or mechanical relevance within the story. Some people genuinely feel, I think, that if you roll a... It, you should roll your charisma score yeah. when you're having a conversation with an NPC yeah. to see if they believe you or not. And I mean, that I, I, you know, not to knock that style of play, it's not my thing. You know, I, I understand that there's some people who just like to, you know, basically min-max, so to speak. Um, I, I, I've always liked... I've always been in favor of the idea of letting the player try to convince the GM. Mm -hmm. Letting yeah, them use yeah. their own, not necessarily charisma, but let them roleplay their character and the GM gets to determine mm -hmm. if they're convincing enough. Maybe let them roll yeah. to give like a little bit of a bonus or a negative, but other than that... Sort of like be grounded in kind of like the reality of the game where yeah. if they actually said this, I don't care how badly they rolled, this would convince this character. Or vice versa. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Alright, so um, we're going to have to wrap it up a little oh. bit early today. Before we wrap up, just uh, and for those that might have been wondering, uh, the game I was talking about earlier was not Swords and Sorcery, but Swords and Wizard Okay. Just in case for those that might have been listening and like, ah, I want to know the name of that. <laughs> Hear that, uh, that or it's was, like, no, Jim, you're yes, wrong. Uh, that was the that was the D and D first edition uh, retro clone. Okay, cool. For those that want to go out and play it. Okay, cool. interesting. So yeah, like I said, we're going to have to wrap up a bit early today. we got to get down to this event that we just mentioned. Um, but yeah, I think this is definitely a the sort of topic we can carry on at another time. Um, I mean, you yeah. know, role-playing sure games... I'm Chris is going to write articles about this. Oh, I might. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> but uh, I mean, role-playing games aren't a genre and medium all into themselves. And so it's definitely something that I think has just as much room to talk about as, you know, video games. So Absolutely. Anyway, yeah. this has been uh, podcast number six, uh, BackwardCompatible.com. Uh, we're here at the Fillmore Pub, so shout out to you guys. Thanks for having us again. Um, I'm Chris. I'm Richard. And I'm Jim. And uh, we'll see you guys next time. We want you to join the discussion on our website, backward-compatible.com. You bring a unique perspective, and dialogue makes everyone better. Leave a comment in our podcast section, and if it's good, one of the crew members will respond to it. This time, let us know which RPGs you think are best for new players, and how well they teach the unwritten rules of role-playing. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible. Are we only on podcast number six? Wow. Feels like we've done more. Yeah. We'll leave this part in. <laughs> Feels like we've done more. <laughs> Damn it. All right. Six podcasts. Six podcasts. Podcast. I guess we have only done six, actually. It's been yeah. more weeks than that. It's just... It's because we, we had to skip a few yeah. for other things. Can we stop it? We can.